And then, of course, the neutron walks into a bar. <laughs> and uh, then he ordered a margarita and drank it down. He ordered a martini, drank it down. And uh, he says, what's the, what's, what's the bill? And he says, oh, no charge. <laughs> I didn't say they were good jokes. <laughs> so I, I don't know if we even have to introduce Nolan. Uh, he's obviously got control of everything, and it's working out great. Um, you know, uh, and I normally we start a little late. We're going to start a little early, I think, today, because we, we filled all the seats. And um, I guess people will have to stuff themselves with wherever they want to. I've had a few glancing uh, um, experiences with Nolan. Um, I uh, worked at Atari Research. He left. Uh, but it was fabulous. It was an incredible company, incredible research lab. And then one time I was trying to write a, uh, a special issue on new paradigms for using computers. So I got to write an article with Nolan. We came over to his house and sat in the basement. And, and uh, you know, he told stories. And I wrote. <laughs> um, in any case, uh, this is uh, Talks. It's a weekly uh, forum during, when we have, uh, during the semester. And uh, some of you, uh, we would be delighted if you are interested in coming back, please. But also, if you have a, a story you want to tell, we uh, we love we love good talks from interesting people. And there's a lot of interesting people in the room for this special occasion. So um, uh, this uh, this the series is online, um, and people can watch it from everywhere in the world. And we'll see how many are watching it right now in a few minutes. And that that's fun. And they might even come in and ask questions. Um, it's also archived on TOCS, uh, CMU TOCS. Do, just, just check for it. There's 140 or so talks that have been given in this forum over the last five years. So uh, there that, there's, there's that way of getting to it. And uh, when you're going when you're gonna ask a question, uh, just just uh, make it known, and I'll just talk back to you. Speak into this. Speak into it. Hello. Oh, okay. So there's a little place to speak into, and uh, we tend to we tend to toss the conversation around that way. Um, you could you could also push this button. But the people have such a hard time wanting to hold that button down. It's just I prefer if they just and we can tell who's who's speaking. So in any case, um, thank you for coming. And at uh, and at two thirty, something like that, when we when we decide we're, we're ready, we'll go out into the hall and we can have more conversation and eat some cookies and, and some soda. So thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Well, it's always, it's always fun. Uh, it's always fun to be in a room of big brains. And, uh, you know, big brains really are fascinating to talk to and to bounce ideas off. And, and uh, it's about as good a time as you can possibly have. I thought I'd sort of start with a little history. And, uh, and I used to call my, my speeches an accidental life because I feel like so much of what's happened to me has been accidental. Probably one of the most interesting things is if you were to have a video screen connected to a computer in the early 60s, it was basically three places in the world. One was MIT, one was the AI lab at Stanford, and one was Dr. Evans and Sutherland at the University of Utah. One of those doesn't belong. Uh, or, or not. But anyway, this is a graphics processor. Each of these cards represents two flip-flops. And uh, I just always like that because it, it puts in context. You've got so much more compute power in, uh, in an Arduino or a Raspberry Pi than you have in this great big rack of equipment. But that's where that's where I really started because I, uh, as an undergraduate, I always had an office. And, uh, and you know, undergraduates weren't supposed to have offices, but I've always been one of these guys that felt that no matter what the bureaucracy, that I could beat it. And, um, and so a week or two before this, the year would start, I would go and I'd move all my stuff into a, into a spare office, put my name on the door. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, if somebody was assigned to that office later on, 
I just welcomed them as my new roommate. And, uh, and it always worked. The only problem with it is being an undergraduate, I had to put, you know, paper around my textbooks so they didn't see that I was actually an undergraduate. But one year, I, the only office that I could find was in the computer graphics laboratory of, of Dr. Evans. And just by kind of showing up, you pretty soon they start thinking you belong. And I've always been a great poser. Um, and, and being able to pose is actually a good thing. You know, an elegant word for posing is you get your mind into the space and you, you position it. So if you're going to be a great baseball player, you act like a great baseball player, and it's pretty soon you are. Anyway, so I was working summers at Lagoon which is a medium-scale amusement park halfway between Salt Lake and Ogden. And it turned out that I'm a pretty good carny. Uh, and I learned how to sell balls to knock down milk bottles and, and throw quarters to cover spots and various things. And pretty soon I became manager of the department and I understood and learned all about the economics of the arcade business as well, because I had two large arcades. And in those days, we had games in the arcade. They just weren't video games. But I knew that they had to earn about 20 to $30 a week um, or, or a, a day, and that they had to be about $1,000 to buy one in 19. $60. So, as we, another amusement park shot, this is a PDP-1, and this was a converted radar display, XY, and a guy named Steve Russell at MIT programmed a game called Space War. And it was an epiphany. Deck saw the game, shipped it with every computer, and all of a sudden, if you could steal your way inside the Hello Sanctum Sanctorium of the computer lab, you could play video games. Well, since I had an office and I could jam the lock, I could steal computer time from about 2 in the morning till 5 every night, which I did faithfully. Um, it wasn't great for my grades, but, it, I, but I really fell in love with video games. And so I knew, absolutely, that if I could make this game available for a quarter at my amusement park arcade, that it would be successful. There was no question about it. So all I had to do was take a million dollar computer and, and have it paid for by a quarter of the time. That seemed a reach for me. And so I sort of filed it away in my brain, said maybe someday, because computers were dropping in cost every day. This one came along, a little cheaper. Oh, incidentally, 100 kilohertz, blistering speed. Um, but that actually wasn't the first video game. The first video game was from Willie Higginbotham at Brookhaven Labs in 1958. And he basically used capacitors and resistors and relays and created a ping pong game on an oscilloscope. And uh, to my knowledge, that was the absolute first video game. And uh, it was successful, but not commercialized. In Mountain View, just literally down the, down the street, was a company called Nutty Associates that did computer quiz. There was no computer in that. It was a slide projector. <laughs> Which incidentally was what the video game, or what the games, the coin op games were at the time. If you were putting quarters into a arcade machine, they tended to be motorized slide projectors. They'd take a bulb, some lenses, a 
piece of film that looked like a race car, and they projected onto a, a frosted screen, and it was a driving game. Was it lame? Yeah. Was it the best they had? Yeah. Did it make a lot of money? Yeah. And so that's what the, the nature was of the arcade business in the 60s. Then came along the day that a computer came across my desk from a trade magazine that said it was a $4,000 mini computer, 8-bit, blistering speed, 500 kilohertz. Um, and, uh, and I started the design. And my idea was that the graphics displays were about $20,000 at the time. And I felt, OK, mass production makes TV sets about 100 bucks, And if I could just create the interface between the mini computer and a, a regular raster scan television set, I'd be mostly there. And with the $4,000 computer, if I could get three or four coin slots, so I was going to multitask. Boy, was I stupid. Uh, <laughs> If I could multitask four raster scan screens off that one mini computer, I'd get my cost constraints. And I'd, I could easily do four, four coin slots and done. So I got doing the design. And of course, I kept running out of time because a raster scan television set sucks data at prodigious rates. And so I started making little circuits that would offload tasks off of the computer. And I figured out a way to do the star fields, ways to do um, scores on the screen, you know, just display so I didn't have to do that in, in software. Well, even with that, I dropped the, the thing from four screens to three screens to two screens. And I figured even though it was more expensive, it'd still be pretty good. Finally, it was actually Thanksgiving of 1969, and I abandoned the project. I was going to, I felt that I could get it done. Just after Thanksgiving turkey, as my cells were afloat in tryptophan, <laughs> I had the epiphany. And the epiphany was to hell with the, heart, the mini computer. I'll do it all in hardware. And so the first video game, the architecture looked wonderful. And, and now my cost of computer was 300 bucks because it was just flip-flops, counters, Boolean logic. It was a big signal generator, state machine. It had a clock. I divided down the clock for horizontal and vertical sync, got the things moving, and I was, I was in business. So I licensed it to Nutty Associates, because I didn't have any money, and I felt that they could put it in. And so I modeled this cabinet in modeling clay uh, on my kitchen table, took it down to a fiberglass boat manufacturer who scaled it up. They were actually an Aptos. And, uh, and in some ways, there's a thing that means that there's too much innovation. Um, nobody knew what to think of this thing. I thought it looked spacey and cool. Um, but rotation right, rotation left thrust and fire, four buttons. And, uh, but you had to rotate the rocket around to slow down retro thrust. I mean, it followed the laws of physics. All my friends loved it. All my friends were engineers. <laughs> uh, and then the next thing you, we did is what I call the false positive. We did the test, our first test location, on this machine was Dutch Goose. And of course, nothing but Stanford students. Made money like it was a house of fire. 
and so we were we were good to go. Well, it turned out that this machine in a beer bar earned no money. Everybody was baffled by it. What the hell is this thing? And so around college campus is good, but it was not what I'd call a major hit. The video game business was not wonderful. Oh, instantly, there's a there was a bar over the topless bar called the Brass Rail over in the Mountain View here. And she was one of the dancers there. That's a whole other story. <laughs> anyway. So here we, uh, here we are. We decided Al Alcorn, who was my tech at Ampex, where I was working before, had just come on his very first day. The day that I had gone up to see the Magnafox game, because we'd been in business for computer space for about two years. And, um, and I'd heard somebody has a video game in, in Burlingame. And I went to the Hyatt or one of the things, went in, signed in, and saw this, what I thought was a horrible game. It was Odyssey. And you, it was playing a game of ping pong. And as bad as I thought it was, it was fuzzy, it was nonlinear, it had a lot of things that I thought were bad game design. But people seemed to be enjoying it. So driving back, I thought, well, you know, how would I fix that? And, excuse me, <coughs> and, uh, and so when I got back to our place, we were over on Scott's Boulevard, Scott Boulevard, I assigned Al to make a ping pong game. And I explained what, how I wanted it and that sort of thing. In one week, he had it wired up, working. And it was pretty fun, but not real fun. And because angle reflection e equals angle of, angle of incidence equals angle of refraction, reflection, so it turns out that if the paddle operated under that principle, the game was strictly defense. There was no offensive ability, because wherever you hit the ball, it would just bang, bang go off. So we made a subtle change. And the subtle change was where you hit the paddle determined the angle that it came off. It hit the lower part, the ball. So now, and the more ob the, the closer you got to the edge of the paddle, the more obtuse the angle was, and therefore the harder to return. Which turns out, I, mean, I didn't really understand game dynamics that much, but it turns out that's magical. Because what you always want to do is max is match the maximum offensive shot, shot with the maximum risk of failure. And it really worked. And so we put that in, and all of a sudden the game was wonderful. All of a sudden, the game was really fun, but for a problem. As we got good, we could keep the ball going all the time. And so we said, okay, after X number of volleys, let's just speed the ball up. That was a help. And then we speeded it up again, and that was a help. But we still had to keep the game time less than three minutes on average. If you didn't do that, you wouldn't, the game wouldn't earn enough money because you couldn't get enough new quarters. And then the coup de gras, we cut the size of the paddle in half after a volley of 15. Worked. That was really hard to, to, to keep it going. And the game was ready to go. OK. I had a contract with Bally to do a driving game. Because when I'd left Nutting, now, one of the things that's wonderful about Silicon Valley is that everybody has worked next to somebody that's an idiot that has gone off and started a company and done well. And you say to yourself, I know that person. It, he's an idiot and he's doing really well. What's the difference? Ah, he, made a, he took a risk. I didn't. And so, so 
entrepreneurship leads to entrepreneurship because the most important characteristic of success is to give it a try. I can guarantee you if you do not try, you won't be successful as an entrepreneur. But sometimes, if you try, you are. So later on, Atari did a whole bunch of things. Oh, Ted wanted me to tell you the story about when we put this game on test, the rooster tea feathers over in Sunnyvale. Um, two days in, we got a service call. And the service call said this game all of a sudden quit working. And we found out that the problem was the cash box had completely filled up and it wouldn't take orders anymore. Those are the kind of engineering problems that are very fixable. <laughs> A little bit on the social dynamics. The typical 98-pound hot girl could beat the typical 220-pound football player. Small muscle coordination, women have much better small muscle coordination than men do. Men have better large muscle coordination, but when it comes to turning that knob precisely, women rock. And so, just at the time of women's liberation, women fell in love with Pong. And I have five sons, and I told them, if you can attract the women, the guys will somehow find them. It works, right? <laughs> so anyway, it became a social phenomenon as much because of the dynamics of what was going on at the time as everything else. So this is Al Alcorn. He was my first technical hire. Uh, this is Ted Dabney. He was my partner, my office mate at, at Ampex. And uh, I bought him out a year and a half later. I was, I was a little too rambunctious for him. I can remember saying, guys, we've got to ramp manufacturing up to 100 a day. And everybody looked at me like I was crazy. Two months later, we were at 200 a day. Anyway, another story. This is Fred. He started to steal from us. Um, <laughs> but win some, lose some. These are some of our other games. And then, of course, the Atari 2600 was the big knock-it-out-of-the-park success. 128 bytes of memory. That isn't much at all. In fact, let me ask you the question. With 128 bytes, can you play a game of chess? 64 positions, 32 different items. Sounds like it doesn't work. But if you split the bytes in two, it turns out that you can get there. And we actually had an Atari cartridge that played chess. And I actually lost $500 to the guy who said he could do it. And I said, no way. But it was a happy $500 loss. Um, what you need to understand is the microprocessor hadn't been invented when the video game started. And so these were not blind Neumann architecture. It wasn't until 6502 with the Atari 2600 that they became von Neumann architecture with, uh, with programs. And of course, that allowed us to do ROMs and, and the, the Atari VCS. This was the big one. And it turns out that these two guys worked for me. Well, actually, Jobs worked for me. And, uh, and Jobs was kind of a uh, difficult fellow, um, but smart and capable and uh, irascible. And the engineers were constantly, he was a tech, and the engineers were constantly complaining about him. And, but I felt there was some redeemable value. And so I put him on the night shift, of which there wasn't one. Uh, <laughs> he was the sole, sole member of the engineering night shift. But 
that there was a, there was actually a mean to my, means to my madness, because I knew that if it was the night shift, that Waz would be there all the time too. So I basically was able to hire two Steves for the price of one, and uh, and they did the game called Breakout, which is a huge success, and uh, and later on. After the Apple came along, they said, hey, can we, can we ship Breakout with the Apple too? And I said, sure. Turns out that 6502 was selected by Atari. We had a, a contract. We were buying them for 8 bucks. This price was like 64 The 65, you know, the 6800, which was the Motorola, was like 80 bucks to 100 bucks, And... Uh, and this become because we used so many of them, they became cheap, and therefore it became the microprocessor for the Apple II. Some would say that Atari Parts built the first hundred Apples, but I'm not sure that's actually true. <laughs> it's it's all good fun, you know. We used to be very Cavalier with parts because you know they were called G jobs, and if an engineer wanted to go home and build something of their own, you know, okay, building hundred maybe that was stretching it a little bit. Uh, jobs and I hung out a lot. Um, he was there to the opening of my Paris house. I went through a grand phase where you know having a fifteen thousand square foot house. Paris seemed like a good idea. Um, it wasn't, but <laughs> it, w it was fun at the time. Um, I don't know why that slide's there, but um, the uh, there's a lot of interesting things that are going on. Uh, and Versix is a physical game experience. My 19-year-old son is doing it. There's a laser maze and various things. The idea is to mash up between an arcade and a movie. And so six people enter a room, get through the maze, do various things, and uh, charge eight bucks. And in 35 minutes, they've been a participant in the story. They've got one that they're working on right now in which you are Indiana Jones. And uh, I've got a 19-year-old that's got a million-dollar-plus business. He's independent, and I'm really proud of him, you know? I've got, I've got three entrepreneurial sons and a screenwriter and a, uh, and, a guy, and, a, and a guy who is really, really good artist, graphics designer, and, uh, and then my daughter is a... Uh, is a uh, financial planner. Another daughter is a a great uh, PR specialist. Did PR for Oracle and has her own company. And, uh, and then one daughter who's a yoga instructor and a mother. So, you know, takes all time. Incidentally, in Los Angeles, do you know how you can get a, a screenwriter off your doorstep? Pay for the pizza. <laughs> you know, I tell that to my son, and he's not amused at all. But, but he did do a Kickstarter, shot a movie, is um, is about to go on the, the wampum path for uh, uh, for Sundance and the film festivals, and uh, he's got some interest in expanding it to a full-length motion picture. So I might, you know, it's entrepreneurial, but it's not very technical. Anyway, I think that um, one of the interesting things that is going to happen is the whole Google Glass and the virtual reality uh, world. Um, I'm not sure whether this is the real way, but for me, as I get older, Having facial recognition and a augmented overlay would really be helpful to me. 
much. I kind of like the slutty ex-girlfriend description, but that's, that's another story. My book, Finding the Next Steve Jobs, is it's really about how to hire, keep, and build your brain. And the, the, the one thing that you really need to remember, how do you be, how are you creative? Creativity, believe it or not, is less about the idea and more about doing, being active, being always pushing the envelope, being, create, being curious. I've often felt that the best aspect of the creative person is to be curious about everything. And I am a browser of trade shows. Every time I'm in the vicinity of a trade show, I go to them. And a trade show actually was key to starting Chuck E. Cheese. Um, did you know that Chuck E. Cheese started out as Coyote Pizza? Coyote Pizza, uh, we wanted, the, the nature of the coin-operated game business is that we sold games for $1,000 to $1,500. And in their life, they make twenty to 50000 So it didn't take rocket science to say I'm on the wrong side of that equation. We should be operating our machines as opposed to just building them and selling them. But we had a problem. We didn't want to compete with our customers. So we decided that we would build our own chain of arcades and just kind of tack pizza along the side. Anybody who's ever tasted our pizza will understand that. Uh, <laughs> But it, it was simple to build, very, very cost effective, and it took a waiting time, which would be great for playing games. But I felt there needed to be some entertainment. And just down off Lawrence Road, there was a place called Pizza and Pipes, and it had a restored Wurlitzer Theater organ, and the place was packed whenever they had an organist there playing it. And you could see the pipes, and they had lights on them. And, drums and various things, and I thought, you know, if we can build something that is entertainment and just run it off a computer, it would be great. But it had to be very, very reliable. And that's where a trade show came in. I went to a trade show in factory automation. And the factory automation was really all about stuff, you know. They were blowing things around through pneumatic tubes. They were vibrating things and lining up screws. And one place had all these little pneumatic actuators. And I went up to the, the guy and I said, you know, I've seen a lot of hydraulics, but I hadn't ever really seen pneumatics before. And, uh, and I said, you know, how many, how many operations do you get out of one of these cylinders? He said, oh, 10 to 30 million. That's robust. And I said, how much are they? He said, oh, that one's about three bucks. In that instant, Chuck E. Cheese, the moving mechanical robot, was designed. I knew it had to be pneumatic. I knew that we could, it, it, it would last. And it was going to be good enough. But it hadn't become Chuck E. Cheese yet. It was Coyote Pizza. And I went to a trade show in, uh, in Orlando for the amusement park industry. And there was a stand there that had walk-around costumes, life-size. And I saw a coyote. I said, because I had high knowledge that my people could make and move, but I didn't, we didn't have that kind of sculptured artist. So I bought this, this coyote costume, shipped it back. Gave it to engineering. A couple of weeks later, I said, have you got the coyote moving yet? And he said, what coyote? And I said, the coyote I sent He says, that's not a coyote. It's a rat. <laughs> and, I said, and I said, how do you know? He said, well, it's got a big pink tail, for one thing, which I hadn't seen. And the thing about caricatures is you have a lot of mental overlay. 
So that once you think of it as a coyote, it can be a coyote. But the minute he said it was a rat, you looked at it and you said, yeah, yeah it was a rat. <laughs> and, uh, and so now we had a problem. He said, you know, my marketing department says, you cannot call a restaurant Rick Rat's Pizza. You know, it, uh, I mean, rats are dirty. You lose your, your health code. You'll end up with a D on, on your, your health code things if you feature a rat. It's just wrong. I said, well, can it be a rat that we don't call it that? They said, probably. It's kind of like Mickey Mouse and that sort of thing. You sort of de-emphasize the ratness of the rat. And, uh, and I said, well, name it for us. And they came back a week later and said, we've got a perfect name. It's a three-smile name. I said, what is it? And they said, Chuck E. Cheese. So Coyote Pizza turned into Chuck E. Cheese. Anyway. Um, we are moving to a merit-based society. And at Atari, we ignored credentials. We didn't care whether you graduated from college. We didn't care. In fact, the prime architect for the Atari 2600 was a guy who never finished high school. Self-taught engineer. Brilliant guy. And... Uh, and without him, the architecture would have been very different. The other thing when you're hiring or, or, or looking to build something, really focus on intensity. You can train for everything except intensity. People who are alive, who are curious, who are full of life, who are constantly pushing the envelope, those are the people you want to surround yourself with. And then you want to build your brain. And it turns out that building your brain is different. We've been doing all kinds of brain research on our, my current project, Brain Rush. And what, what it turns out is the steep part of the learning curve is where all the neurogenesis happens. For example, I like to play chess. The neurogenesis for, that I get from playing chess all happened when I was seven and eight when I learned how to play. By the time I was ten, the neurogenesis was essentially over. Playing Sudoku, neurogenic for maybe the first 50 games. After that, no more neurogenesis. So the trick is to constantly do different things, drive to work different way every day. And always be trying something new and different. I always thought that it was because I had attention deficit disorder, but now I understand that I was just building my brain. Um, and it's really heartfelt, you know, that, that that's happening. But you can cheat. And I have been doing something for the last five years that has made me happier and really changed things. It's called the dice game. And you write down 11 things on a, on strip, on a strip of paper each. And uh, five of them are things that you sort of are on your bucket list of things that you think you want to do but don't have quite time. And then five of them are things that you don't think you could do. And so I did that and it came up that I had to write a book. Now, understand that I'm an engineer. I like mathematics, I like physics, things like that. But I was born dyslexic and Spelling has, and I have never been friends. And grammar and punctuation, like my keyboard could not have a comma and I would have never noticed. Um, I almost flunked freshman English. But I did okay with, uh, with engineering writing, which was basically, you know, you know, things to do with selling the product and what have you. But I said, okay, 
One of the things that happens when you decide to do something, you tend to overthink it. For example, how many people write a book thinking that it will never be published? Few. But I was sure that my book would never be published, but I had to do it because the dice told me to. Shake the dice, it came up, book, have to write it. So I started writing, and I found out that spell checkers work, and that you can actually have one of your friends edit things, and, and pretty soon, and I did a science fiction book. And I started sending it around, and of course my daughter, you know, your, your family are your most severe critics. And my daughter read the book, and it was a science fiction book. It's, about, it's called Video Games 2071. And she said, Dad, this reads like stereo instructions. She says, it's an interesting, fast-moving story, but, uh, sorry about that. It's a fast-moving story, but you just don't say he walked into a building. You've got to say it's a tall building, it's green, it's, it's covered in moss. It's just, just describe shit. So, literally, I went from a 60,000-word tome to a 90,000-word tome just by tricking it up. And, um, and so they started saying, yeah, no, this is a good science fiction book. You should publish it. And so, and this is just literally an hour a day. I'm a fast typist, and, and, and it was fun. And, and a really interesting thing happened. In doing a novel, and it, it said, you know, I went into a website and for struggling new authors and all that sort of thing. And it says, don't start with the story. Start with the characters. And do at least two pages on each character. Go into their background and their birth order and how tall they are and what they eat for breakfast. And, and, and just really get to know your character. And then... Describe the world they're in and really get into some detail. And then write the story. The thing that was so fun is after I did that, it was the most interesting blend between reading and writing. I never thought that would happen. I could hardly wait to get up in the morning and find out what my people were going to do that day. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, and, and I'd get them into trouble, and then I'd get them out of trouble, and, and it, was, it, it was really fun. It was, it was as much like reading as it was like writing. And so um, I decided I was going to see if I could get it published. So I went to a, a couple of publishers, and one of them said, you know, I like your book, but you really need to start with nonfiction, because you've got some gravitas in the nonfiction world. And they said, what do you like to talk about? And I said, well, creativity and entrepreneurship and various things. And he said, well, now you, you gave Steve Jobs his first job. That's a hook. And he said, okay, right, here's the title. And he came up with the title. And he says, finding the next Steve Jobs. And, and slap in everything you know about creativity and various things. And that was a year ago. And here we are. So... The dice got me into this thing. And, and I had... Where, where is your first book? What? what? The first book, the one with the story. Oh, the story? It's sitting on my shelf, and I'm going to publish it next. The trick is, they say, don't dilute yourself. Get this first book of yours really rocking. And so I want you to all go and buy... <laughs> Several copies. I understand that they, they're very tasty and, and you can eat one for breakfast every morning. But um, it's called Finding the Next Steve Jobs and, and it's great fun. And, am I running out of time? Got it. No? Okay. Um, we got toxic. This is one that people look at. And it turns out that every company needs somebody that's a little obnoxious. Because very often people 
who are the smartest people in the room, are obnoxious about it. But when the chips are down, you kind of need those people. So when I hear companies wanting to make sure that everybody in the company can sit around a campfire and sing Kumbaya, um, what they're really doing is they're forcing homogeneity in their company. And that's maybe okay if you're selling wheat. But if you're trying to create interesting things, it all comes from the spiky people. Because when you are an innovator, it's very lonely. Everybody believes in innovation, but nobody will believe in your innovation. And the more radical your innovation is, the most likely you are to be alone in the room. And so you have to have the self-confidence of your conviction because chances are nobody else is going to see it. And that's the proof. I mean, have people come and say, I don't want anybody to steal my idea. I can't show it to anybody. I say, you don't get it. You can't give away your idea. <laughs> and and that, that the I... The, the reality of today's world is that everybody edits. It's like the natural thing to be cynical. If somebody in your company says, I'm just being the devil's advocate, more than three times, you fire their ass. Because there, any idiot can say no. Any idiot. You can be a blithering, blundering dumb shit and, and be a devil's advocate. Only allow people to present things that are better. Because not doing is not acceptable. You got to do. So therefore, the person who is a naysayer, devil's advocate, you put them online. You say, okay, what should we do? And if they start stumbling and kicking the floor, you don't need them in your organization. You know, they're just taking up valuable space and breathing way too much air. <laughs> Advertise creatively. One thing, redefine failure. Turns out that a lot of times failed projects are not really failed. They're learning. Every failed product that you have, you learn something from. Like I just had a company, in, in fact, it was called Uwink, and we had a restaurant. And uh, the idea was to have ordering on the, at the table and games all around the place so that you could play group games and that sort of thing. People loved it. But we were aiming it at young adults. So it turned out the people that really loved us were young kids and parents. It was basically Chuck E. Cheese for tweens. And we didn't know it. And it turns out that if you have too many ankle biters around, the young adults don't want to go. And so it was a thing where our target demographics was too good for a demographic that we didn't want, that it wasn't designed for. You don't need to have a full liquor bar. You don't need a complex menu. I had forgotten what I'd learned from Chuck E. Cheese. You know, if you're going to have fun, families are pretty good. But the families, they tend to be focused on Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday, period. You can shoot a cannon through a Chuck E. Cheese, generally on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And so you have to put it into crappy location that's really cheap, get a lot of capacity so you can just rack them and stack them on the weekends. You're not supposed to talk about racking and stacking kids, are you? <laughs> Incidentally, just so you know, never let your kids into a ball crawl. It's the most disgusting thing in the world. 
you know, where you burrow through the balls and that sort of thing. The stuff you find on the bottom of ball crawl you don't want to deal with. I just ruined a whole bunch of kids' fun. <laughs> Think toys. You know that most innovations are considered toy-like or foolish. The automobile was considered a toy. Airplane, considered a toy. Telephone, considered a toy. And the reason is that things don't become important. They don't become a necessity until they become ubiquitous. And so a lot of times when you build toys, you're actually building the future, and you don't know it. For example, I spent a lot of money trying to build a personal robot. And uh, the timing wasn't right. And everybody thought it was a toy. I guarantee you that a personal robot is going to be one of the next big areas. And if anybody wants to build one, I'm about ready to do it again. Even though my wife told me that she would divorce me if I tried another robotics project. <laughs> I've tried three of them and lost money every time. But I think the timing's right now. <laughs> the first one died, the, the company failed, on a noise immunity problem. Turns out when the little robots are running around, they discharge static electricity. Well, a blue screen of death on a computer, that's no big deal. You reboot and, and go on your merry way. In a robot, if you're going at full speed towards the stairwell and all of a sudden your, uh, all of your fail-safes don't work anymore, it's not good. We used to call that the mow the baby mode. Uh, and, and so you, you have to, the requirements for robustness on the part of a personal robot that's running around, because they're going to be 35, 40, 50 pounds. 30 or 40 pounds rolling down a stairway is a problem. <laughs> you know, so you got to make sure that that fact doesn't happen. But I still believe that the world would be a better place if we had a lot of little robots running around. They did nothing more than tell jokes. What else have I got here? Games, build spring, do something different, move, just act. Oh, we got a question back here. Hang on. <coughs> yes. Um, yes, thank you so much for the history and, and all that you've been sharing with us. It's been fantastic to hear. I'm wondering if you're going to talk a little bit about Brain Rush and your your um, educational advances that you're, you described in your writing. What a great shill you are. All right. Good. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't actually a shill, but I, I, I'm always just dancing when I... Yeah. Brain Rush is based, I asked myself, this, this is probably five, six years ago. I just asked a simple question, how do you learn? How do people learn? And it turns out that there are some interesting parallels between games and learning. And a lot of it has to do with the concept of flow. But let me tell you five rules that for most I'd say 60, 70 percent of anything you ever want to learn, you can use these rules and get an acceleration of 10 to 20 times. That is, you can learn something 10 percent of the time. First rule, extreme time pressure. Extreme time pressure focuses the brain. You are in the present. You're focusing on the task at hand. You're not worrying about the girl's pigtails in front of you, the birds outside, what you're going to do after you get out of this boring lecture. Hyperfocus. Two, active. If you're watching a lecture, you're watching a movie, if you're reading a book and you're an fMRI, nothing lights up. 
The minute you're asked to make a cognitive decision, yes, no, right, left, up, down, A, B, C, D, you're thinking about it. And all of a sudden, that means you're engaged. Active. Our software requires a response every three to five seconds. Three, spaced repetition. Turns out our brains are designed to forget, not to remember. Mine is actually well designed in that. And, uh, and it's through repetition that your brain starts to create a permanent memory. And it's better if it's spaced. So for example, if you're a cocktail party, you're introduced to somebody, you want to remember that person's name, make sure that within the first 30 seconds, you get two repetitions. You ask them the name, you repeat it back. Before the person walks away, you ask them, now what was your name again? They say it, you repeat it back. Then, after an hour at that cocktail party, and a martini, no, <laughs> you ask them again, and maybe get a card. So that's basically three, four repetitions. If you can then review that person's card after a good night's sleep, you've probably got it. You've probably got it for a number of months. Now, everybody's brain has a di different decay rate for information and a different decay rate based on subject. It's called schema affinities. If you like physics, anything you learn about physics will have a lower decay rate than if you're not nuts about biology. You may have an extremely high biology decay rate. The software that we have starts to understand what your decay rate is. And if you review just before you forget, it, it extends that. We believe that a properly structured review process with our software, that you'll be re able to remember everything you learned in high school and college for the rest of your life, unless your brain explodes. But, um, but the, the, the technology is pretty clear. Principle four, play to mastery. That is, no A, B, C, D, 100%. You have to know 100% or you don't get through the lesson, period. Turns out that that flips a bit in your brain somewhere that says oh, everything is important. I can't slide by this. I can't slide by that. And it turns out to be more effective than if you just say you get to play for 10 minutes and then you're going to be done. Flipping that bit, chances are they can com totally complete that lesson in nine minutes. It actually takes shorter time if they flip that bit and know that they have to play to mastery. Really curious. The fifth principle is schema. And that is, can we change the vocabulary? change the syntax so that it becomes part of your affinity cycle. Can I teach statistics with the vocabulary of baseball? And all of a sudden, things become much more effective and good. Now, Bloom's taxonomy is basically a categorization of knowledge. And it starts out with facts, and then it than characteristics. And as you climb up, you're getting to more and more conceptual things. About 60% in high school of everything you learn can be categorized through the bottom three levels of Bloom's taxonomy. Then what you need to be able to do, and, and our theory is get rid of all the drill and kill stuff. Just you know, it takes 10% of the time. So that we can now work on projects and deep thinking and deep understanding, which takes longer. You can't do that using the tools that I'm talking about. But once you have the full foundation, 
you're really rocking and rolling. So, Brain Rush is building educational engines. And we've defined 12 of them, all the way from reference engines to sequence engines to, you know, automated and powerful flashcard programs and identification programs. And we think we can get all three of Bloom's taxonomy bottom levels done and poke up in some of the other stuff. We think that we can essentially complete all the academics of four years of high school in six months, leaving all the rest of the time to learn what I think are, 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 are modern skills. Everybody, everybody in this room should have or should in the future Mar have a continual presence on eBay as a marketeer. You got to know how to sell. And eBay is so simple. You know, figure out how to change the pitch, photograph it better. Just, just find junk and sell it. And, and you may find that there's a very interesting skill that's, that you have that will be valuable to you forever. I think everybody needs to know a little bit of programming. I think everybody needs to be able to build their own website. I think that everybody <coughs> should understand a little bit about an Arduino. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of gadgets or Raspberry Pis that are pretty simple, that take you less than a week to master some kind of level. And if you're a little bit facile, you can do that. But anyway, Brain Rush, we, um, it's a free service. We want you, in fact, your homework assignment for tonight is to build a brain rush based around something that you are either good at or something that you want to learn, and then publish it. Because if you want to learn it, probably somebody else does too. And uh, it'll fill out the database. Think of it as Wikipedia meets Zynga. It's free. It opens up. And because it, it's so good and it's so powerful that millions of people will be using it and then I'll make a whole bunch of money, which, which works for me. Anyway. That's great. You know, I, we're running low on time, but there's oh, one I'm sorry. I, 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 I ramble. No, 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 no. It's very focused. It's wonderful. Um, we want to do it. Uh, so to ask your yeah, I just had one question. I wanted to know what the other sides of your dice were, what you had written on there. Say again? I wanted to know what the nine other things on your dice were. You said one of them was to write a book, so what are the other ones? <laughs> ah. I actually just did one, uh, go to Machu Picchu. Um, and uh, uh, learn Spanish is one. Uh, learn how to play the banjo, picking in a Picking and fiddling. Another one is I want to learn Tai Chi. Um, another one is I want to, now this, you'll get a kick out of this, program with my own hands a video game. Because, you know, I know a lot about games and a lot of things, but I actually haven't programmed. <laughs> A video game for 30 years, and so I'm hopelessly obsolete. And uh, and so, in some ways, coming up and being a big video game maven, I'm a poser, and, uh, and I just feel like I can fix that. Well, if you're a poser, I don't know what the rest of us are. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Nolan, uh, you know, it's time for us to go out into the hall and, and get to know each other a little better. Really appreciate fantastic talk. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, Nolan, for coming here. Uh, come on out. Good fun. Buy my book. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you've all